do read it, you're misinformed. And I think the fact that Mr. Obama's mother is a white woman, I think it prevents them from going hard on the race question. And when you study Africa, when you study the fall of Africa, you will find that Africa was not destroyed by white armies. Africa was destroyed by Banlato armies. What normally happened was the European conquerors came into Africa, cohabitated with the women, and over the process of 20 to 40 years, they changed the color. And then they used their mulatto offspring to fight against their darker brothers. Something that still goes on today in America. In fact, in Nigeria, as we speak, the Orientals who have invaded the Nigerian economy are marrying African women to do the same thing, to bastardize the native population, to raise up an entire group of Oriental African children who they will then use to oppress the native Africans. When you don't study your history, you repeat it. So we're going to talk about the seven deadly sins. As I said a minute ago, much of what we suffer as a race of people is deliberate. It is organized. It's amazing how much black people blame themselves for the causes of this situation as opposed to being able to wake themselves up into a larger consciousness to truly see that what goes on with you has been engineered. The psychotropic drug movement, totally engineered. This whole ADHD thing, conduct disorder, it's all been engineered. It comes out of the Federal Anti-Violence Initiative Program, which, come, which comes out of the 1980s. If you go back in your memory, you will remember that in the 1980s, the United States government was pouring money into a research project to determine whether or not there was a gene in black men that predisposed them to violence. Everybody remember that? That was about 30 years ago. Because of the massive outcry against that movement, it went underground. Most of us think that it went away. It never went away. One thing you've got to understand about the United States government or any imperial power, whatever it starts, it finishes. And this is where we go wrong. Whatever it starts, it finishes. Okay? So it went underground. And it came back as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, conduct disorder, opposition to defiant disorder, all of which come out of not only the Federal Anti-Violence Initiative, but the new COINTELPRO against the black community. For example, any black boy in America who's diagnosed with a disruptive behavior disorder, which basically means that at, one, at some future point in time, they could cause a serious problem to the establishment, the... FBI automatically has access to their psychological evaluation reports. Let me say that again. Any black boy in America diagnosed with a disruptive behavior disorder, the FBI automatically has access to the psychological reports. Because as J. Edgar Hoover said, the goal of the FBI is to do what? Prevent the rise of another black messiah. We also know that the FBI was created on who? The Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. J. Edgar Hoover's first full-time job with the FBI was to do what? Bring down greatest leader of the 19th century, the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. So COINTELPRO is still here. It's in the form of the disruptive behavior disorders. Engineered by the government, the FBI, and who's the third factor? The drug companies. One thing you've got to understand about psychology, it's no longer a true science. Psychology has become psychoeconomics. The makers of Ritalin and Stratera and Prozac and Cycler, and the list goes on, the makers of these major black psychotropic drugs are the number one financiers of the American Psychological Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the National Institute of Mental Health. What I'm trying to get you to understand is much of the diagnoses, much, much of the disruptive behavior diagnoses that we use on black children were paid for by the drug companies. The drug exists before the diagnosis. You need to understand this. The drug exists before the diagnosis. The diagnosis is created to feed the prescription. The diagnosis is created to feed the description. To give you a quick point in what I mean, I think I have with me a copy of the DSM-4 the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. You should have a copy of this. Buy one if you don't. You need it if you're a parent, if you work with children. This is the Bible of psychology and psychiatry. Anything we diagnose comes out of this book. The DSM-4-TR, text revision. It's silver with blue letters. The interesting thing about this book is on the back cover, there's a picture. It says American Psychiatric Association, 1844, with a picture of Benjamin Rush. Benjamin Rush was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. He was also dean of the medical school at Pennsylvania Hospital 
But more importantly, he was a psychiatrist who used to diagnose enslaved Africans with a mental disorder, okay, called nigritude. Nigritude was a mental disorder that rendered the brain of the African totally unusable. You was an imbecile. The chief symptom of nigritude, according to Benjamin Rush, was the turning of the skin black. He was actually the father of American segregation because he said that blacks had to be separated from whites because if whites rubbed up against black skin, they would catch nigritude and thusly their brains would be useless. His picture is not on there by accident. But I want to flip the ADHD real quick to give you a quick point and what I'm talking about as it relates to... Okay. This is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. I'm going to give you some of the chief symptoms. Listen to this. Often fails to give close attention to details. Is careless in schoolwork. Has difficulty sustaining attention in task or play. Often does not seem to listen when spoken to directly. Often does not follow through on instructions or fails to finish schoolwork, chores, or duties in the workplace. Often has difficulty organizing tasks and activities. Often avoids dislike or is reluctant to engage in tasks that require sustained mental effort, such as schoolwork or homework. Often loses things necessary for tasks or activities. Is often easily distracted by extraneous stimuli. Is often forgetful in daily activities. Who in here does this not describe once in a while? Do you see what I'm talking about? I want you to understand why so many of our boys are being diagnosed with this made-up disorder that they don't even have. Because the criteria are so general that any human being on any day of the week can get the diagnosis. Now, trivia question of the day. There used to be something called attention deficit disorder in this book. It was taken out. And now it's only ADHD, primarily hyperactive or primarily inattentive or combined. My question to you is why did they take ADD out? Before there was an ADD and a separate ADHD. There is no more ADD. Anybody who's still walking around with that disorder had it for about 10 years. You follow me? Now my question to you is why did they drop ADD and make everybody ADHD primarily hyper, primarily inattentive, or combined? Why did they get rid of ADD? Anybody want to take a crack? Yes, sir. True, it, it, it was very ambiguous, but the main reason is because there is no drug that can make you pay attention. So when a child gets diagnosed with ADD, it don't lead to a prescription because no drug can make you pay attention. Do you follow me? They can only give a drug to do what? Slow down your central nervous system so you can sit still in the classroom long enough to be miseducated. But no drug can make you pay attention. So they got rid of ADD. Now any child who gets the diagnosis is either primarily hyper, primarily inattentive, but since it's all ADHD now, everybody can get hooked on crack. And the Ritalin is the chemical equivalent of speed. Did you know that? The same illegal drug speed that could put a black man in jail for 10 years, you can give it to a black boy and nothing happens to you. In 1960, the United States government put together a committee to study the long-term effects of psychotropic drugs on a black community. And they found that it would be very, very beneficial to do so. So in our community today, most of us are hooked on some form of a drug. If it ain't psychotropic, it's cancer medicine, heart medicine, diabetes medicine. You'd be hard-pressed to find a person in a black community who isn't on some form of a drug or another. Important to understand. But 70% of all black boys diagnosed with ADHD don't have an active father figure in their life. Since the beginning of the time, you know that when you don't get the attention from your father at home, you go to school looking for it. That's been around forever, but 30 years ago it wasn't ADHD. But now you have people getting paid off black parents' inability to raise them sons in the absence of the father from the home. Most of them don't need nothing but a man in their life. When I was growing up, I was never allowed to be ADHD because my father wouldn't allow it. I was never allowed to be conduct disorder because my father wouldn't allow it. I was never allowed to have oppositional defiant disorder because my father wouldn't allow it. You understand? Most of these diagnoses come from poor discipline. How do you differentiate between the three? ADHD, conduct disorder, ODD. Conduct disorder is physical acting out. Okay, a child with conduct disorder hits and they abuse other kids. Again, lack of discipline, not a real disorder. 
Oppositional defiant is a mousy child. You ask them to do something? No. Go to school? No. Do your work? No. But an ODD kid does not physically attack. Conduct kid physically attacks. And of course, ADHD is supposed to be a what? Brain-based neurological problem, right? But when's the last boy you see diagnosed with ADHD was given an MRI or a CAT scan? It doesn't happen. Most black kids who get diagnosed with ADHD get diagnosed off of the referral from the teacher and the parent, and that's it. Okay? Social engineering. First, we've got to start with the definition. What is engineering? The planning of bringing about something, especially when done with ingenuity or what? Secretiveness. This is the dictionary definition. An engineer, a planning of bringing about of something, especially when done with ingenuity or secretiveness. What is genocide? Definition from the dictionary, the systematic killing of all the people from a national, ethnic, religious group or an attempt to do this. Why did I underline all? The reason why I underline all is because there are a lot of Africans, not just in America but all around the world, who think that if they dress a certain way or talk a certain way or live a certain way or drive a certain way or marry a certain way, that somehow the dominant structure of this society will forget that they're African. And anybody who believes such a thing doesn't totally understand white supremacy and how it operates. You can never be on the in-group, President Obama included. I predict right here in front of you that when he's no longer president, you're going to see a whole slew of negative information about that man come out. Why? Because it is the arrogance of white supremacy that cannot tolerate any black person who thinks that you've been accepted by the in-group. It cannot happen. Look at O.J. Simpson. He thought he was on the in-group. Deadly sin number one. Let's talk about abortion. This is a quote. Several years ago, 17,000 aborted black babies were found in a dumpster outside a pathology laboratory in Los Angeles. 12 to 15,000 were observed to be black. Did you know that? 17,000 aborted babies in L.A. What it's not telling you is that the dumpster where these 17,000 black aborted babies were found was right near a United States government testing laboratory. The United States still has not ratified the 1948 United Nations Genocide Conventions, which made crime of genocide an international crime. Why has the United States government not ratified that document from the Geneva Convention pertaining to genocide? Because the government continues to be, has always been, about the business of getting rid of you. And most of us, when we celebrate the end of slavery, and I don't understand how we celebrate 4th of July, if I can regress for a moment. What were you on July 4th, 1776? You were a slave, and you didn't get your freedom, not with Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, which he made in 1862. It went into effect 1863. That didn't free you. That only freed who? Slaves in states that were currently in armed rebellion. So if Jefferson Davis and the Confederacy had already withdrew from the United States of America, when Lincoln said you were free, did it mean anything? No, because he executed an order over a new nation over which he had no control. And then in 1865, it still didn't matter. Slavery ended in December of 1865 with the passage of the 13th Amendment by the United States Congress. December of 1865. The Emancipation Proclamation meant absolutely nothing. And anybody who celebrates July 4th, I need to question your sanity too. Okay? Because you celebrate the freedom of your former conqueror, colonizer, and slave master, but you didn't have yours yet, and you still don't today. Where's your supermarket? Where's your planes? Where's your ships? Where's your submarine? Where's your hospitals? Where's your multinational corporations? You don't have none, but you'll say you're free because you drive a nice car with big rims on it. Okay? But what do you control? And one of the things we thought to realize black people say, like in Philadelphia, you probably all heard we had a situation where a group of black campers were told that they couldn't swim in a certain pool. They gave the check back and said, I got to go somewhere else. And people say, well, I thought this was over. One thing you got to understand about white racism is never over until every last one of you are gone. 
HIV is not an accident, good people. HIV is what? A strategy for what? Population control. Abortion is a strategy for what? Population control. Ebola, West Nile. In AIDS, they would have you believe what? Where did they say AIDS come from? To this day, where are they saying AIDS come from? A monkey in the Congo. Listen. And this is the official line of the U.S. government. A monkey in the Congo, Central Africa, which is the richest piece of real estate on the face of the earth. Let me say that again. That's why there's so much fighting over there, which is engineered by Western nations. So while we fight against each other, they run out with all the wealth. They do it here, they do it in Africa, they do it in the Caribbean. Because black folks, if there's one thing you can be count on, is to hate one another and fight one another. That is your international reputation. All you need is one bag of weed, one gun, and just stand back and watch. Okay? But anyway, they said that a monkey in the Congo cohabitated with a black woman. And that's how AIDS came to be. And Ebola. Now, they don't say how the disease jumped from the monkey to the woman. But it happened. So my question to you, who in here is foolish enough to think that AIDS and Ebola comes from a monkey cohabitating with a black woman? But that is the dominant line of the government. If you don't believe me, go and research it right now. Next slide. Nah, the arrow down. Come all the way over to your right. Right there. Arrow down. Boom. Dr. Charles Lowe, the National Institute for Health, recommended mandatory abortion for any unmarried girl found to be within the first three months of pregnancy and mandatory sterilization of any such girl given birth out of wedlock for a second time. However, Fannie Lou Hamer intervened and it was canceled. And everybody should know who Fannie Lou Hamer was. That powerful black woman who never gets enough props from our community for what she did for blacks during the 60s by herself. Death threats, beatings, et cetera, et cetera. And Fannie Lou Hamer found out about this attempt that was supposed to be pushed through Congress to force black women to get abortions. And she intervened and it went what? Pushed underground. Because anything that they start, they always finish. In fact, before he became president of the United States, junior sen senator from Illinois, Barack Obama, also just engineered a bill before he got elected, okay, that put X amount of millions of dollars directly into programs aimed at giving abortions to black teenage girls, okay, not preventing pregnancy. I don't want you all to confuse what I'm telling you. I didn't say putting money into preventing. It is to put money into programs that will have teenage girls get abortions. And that's Barack Obama who's a no whole nother topic. I'm not going to get into him because most of y'all couldn't take the truth if you knew it. Next slide down. I'm not going to do it. Abortion. Look at these stats. Since 1973, and I'm a 74 baby, so I'm 35 this coming August, God willing. So since, since 36 years ago, blacks have aborted 13 million children. 35 years. We ain't say since slavery. We said since I was born. 35 years we have aborted 13 million babies in this country. 203,000 have died from AIDS. 306,000 were killed by violent crime. 370,000 killed by car accidents. 1.6 million black babies, people, have died of cancer. 2.3 million blacks have died of heart disease. And the winner is abortion. More of African life is exterminated from abortion than everything else put together. You see that? Now, people are saying what right now? That the Hispanic is about to take over and be the largest ethnic group in America. Yes, because you keep killing your babies. Had it not been for them 13 million abortions, the Hispanic would not be outstripping the African. But I don't want you to focus on that anyway. Because what is a Hispanic? The word Hispanic comes to us when? In 1970, by who? The United States Census Bureau. For what purpose? To divide African people on lines of language so people who speak Spanish who don't want to be black don't have to say they black. Did you just hear what I said? There are Puerto Ricans darker than anybody in this room, and there are Africans lighter than any Puerto Rican. My great-grandfather on both sides of my family tree were Spanish-speaking Cubans. If I wanted to, if I didn't have pride in race, I could easily call myself a Hispanic, go learn some Spanish, and I can go and hide in the other camp. See, nobody's proud to be black anymore because we're losing. We're on the bottom. 
If a young boy wants to join a football team, he don't go to the losing team. He goes to the winning team. And if the winning team won't take him like he is, he will manufacture a new identity so he can fit in. Do you understand what I'm saying? Is it foreign to you? Next slide. How times more likely as white women to have an abortion? Why? Why are black women, and this is controlling for social economic status, because somebody wants to say, well, it's because they're poor. No, this, this controls for social economic status. So a poor black woman is still three times more likely to have an abortion than a poor white woman. Do you want to know why? Because unconsciously, subconsciously, when you hate yourself, as we have been taught, the last thing you want is to see something else that looks just like you. And we go through great lengths to get rid of it. Michael Jackson, much respect to him, is a firm example of what self-hatred can do to a person. And I got a lot of respect for Mike. Although I dislike the fact that he married outside of his race, although I dislike the fact that he glorified white people, I respect him for being a musical genius. Michael Jackson was murdered by the music industry because he did not want to sell back the rights to the Beatles music. You heard it here. If you don't believe me, go research it. In fact, last week the LAPD said that they're going to start treating his death as a homicide, which is what I said the first day I knew he was murdered. A black man owns the right to the music of the most successful white band in American history, and he owns some of Elvis's material. He was smart enough to know that the music, the money in the music industry is not in making the song. It's in controlling the product. Michael Jackson was not broke by a long shot. He didn't have a lot of cash, but he had a lot of wealth. And they tried to force him to liquidate his wealth into cash, and he said, I would not do it. So when he was offered to do 50 concerts in Europe, nobody knew they would sell out in one day, a million tickets in less than 24 hours. But because it did, that was going to allow Michael Jackson the opportunity to make the $400 million that he was in debt for, pay it off, and keep the rights to the Beatles music. So if they wanted to get the catalog back, they had to do what? Kill him before the tour started. And that's exactly what they did. It's the same thing they did to Sam Cooke after he told Malcolm and Martin that he was going to finance the civil rights struggle of the 60s. And he was the first major black artist to own his own publishing. Did you know that? Next slide. It's all social engineering. Anything I say, I can prove it. Every day, more than 1,400 black babies are aborted in the United States. Did you know that? Every day, 1,400 flush down. Flush down. But some of y'all still ain't convinced, so we're going to keep going. Next slide. Since 1970, the black community has aborted 13 million. 13 million. The reason why the so-called Hispanic, which is nothing but a Spanish-speaking African, is about to outstrip you is because they keep their babies. Yes, they do get abortions. They do. You understand? But because the mental side on them was not as severe as what was visited on you, they'll have a house full of 15 and be proud as hell. You have one more than two and you start looking like something wrong with you. They keep this. You get rid of yours. Next slide. You say that I don't have the money to take care of this child. But last time I checked, babies have been raised in the black community without two pennies to rub together since the beginning of the time. Can I get an amen? Black women over 50 years old are 4.7 times more likely to get breast cancer if they had a prior abortion compared to women who have never aborted. Did you know that? This has been a scientific secret for years that there's a direct link between abortion and cancer and black women. It's something about those fluids, those aborted fluids staying up in the wound that somehow ends up going up to the breast and causing all types of cancer problems. Just like there's a direct relationship between what? Antidepressant medicine, black women, and brain cancer, which is why I tell my sisters to find a good therapist. But don't get hooked on them drugs because they're very addictive and they do cause cancer. In fact, most of the psychotropic drugs that we give black children are not allowed to be prescribed to white children in the United Kingdom, Great Britain. Did you know that? They do not allow their children to take the same drugs we get here because of their deadly potency. Something else you need to know. It wasn't until the turn of the century, the year 2000, that the Food and Drug Administration for the first time in history said what? that you could give a child adult psychotropic medicine. Nearly every drug that we give these babies was designed for adults. 
But in 2000, which was only nine years ago, the FDA said, yes, you can give him and him and her drugs that were made for 30-year-old people. Does that make any sense to you? But this is what's going on. Because we believe anything we see on TV, we believe anything the teacher tell us, the principal tell us, and they might be well-meaning individuals. But that's why you've got to get a political consciousness, African people. You can no longer just swallow everything that's given, including what I'm saying. I want you to research me because I know it's 100% fact. But the reason why I need you to research me as well as everybody else, because if you just accept what I say and don't research it, you'll accept the next man. I'm telling you the truth, he might be lying. So you've got to get in the habit of questioning everything especially what you see on CNN. Next slide. Black rates versus white rates. Black women abort 472 babies per every 1,000 black babies born. White women abort only 161 per 1,000. In fact, they love recreating themselves so much that they'll take fertility drugs and everything else to have more. You'll take fertility drugs so you can have none. Or you get the implants and then you take them out and you say you want to have children. They come out with five and six eyes and stuff like that. Because you're messing with mother nature and you're not supposed to be messing with that. Nearly half of all black pregnancies in an abortion. See that? We abort just under half of every baby conceived in our community. And it is a product, not that you ain't got enough money. It's self-hatred. Same reason why black men marry white women. Self-hatred. And if you don't believe me, go to France Fanon book, Black Skin, White Mass. You should know France Fanon, one of the greatest psychiatrists that ever lived. You ain't got to debate me, debate him. He's the master. Okay? Next slide. And I want to be clear. When I say that black men need to marry black women, I don't say it because I look down on white women. Okay? Women are equal, men are equal. No race is better than any other race. But men die sooner than women. So if I got $25 million and I marry a white woman, nine times out of ten, I'm going to leave this earth before her. And she is not going to drive past Muskegee, Michigan, and drop off a $20 check to the hood. Do you understand? That money goes to white people. Marriage is a business. And you don't get into business with anybody who you don't trust after you die with your estate. So we got to keep black money black, and that's why a black man got to marry a, a, a black woman. It's that simple. It ain't about them being less than. It's about us remembering who the hell we is because we forgot. The queen mother of black abortion is a white woman. Did you know that? This woman, Margaret Sanger, was a part of the eugenics movement, which did not start with Hitler. Guess where Hitler got his ideas from? The United States of America. Did you know that? Yes. All he did was take what American scientists have taught him, and then he used it. Margaret Sanger created Planned Parenthood in the 1920s to rid America of unwanted black babies. Planned Parenthood, 1920s, the same time that the Garvey movement began to take off. She specifically said herself that Planned Parenthood was designed to eliminate black babies who were becoming a pesticide or appendage on the white economic order. Next slide. Planned Parenthood rarely recommends adoption over abortion to black mothers. The research is clear. When a black woman goes to Planned Parenthood, get rid of it. White woman goes to Planned Parenthood, why don't you think about abortion? Excuse me, why don't you think about adoption? Why is that? And we got to deal with the adoption issue in the black community too because we are not adopting our children as much as we need to. In fact, you know what? Nobody wants black children. Okay? I work with DHS nationally. I know this. The hardest child to get adopted is the black teenager. If they're more than 12 years old, you don't want them. The white folks don't want them. Nobody wants them. The easiest child to get adopted is an infant. But once a black child hits 14 years old, nobody wants to be bothered with them anymore. So our children are languishing in the system. So everybody in here needs to think about adopting one. You ain't got to do it now, but you need to do it. If even I feel like I'm going to need to adopt as well because nobody's taking our babies. In fact, people of other races who want to adopt, you know what they do? They travel halfway around the world to some remote island, and they'll get a baby before they adopt one right here. And you know what? We do the same thing. We'll go to Pakistan and get one of their kids or something like that instead of adopting our own kids right here. And it's very, very sick. Next slide. Margaret Singer said, quote, the most merciful thing that a large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. She said, more children from the fit 
less from the unfit, that is the chief aim of birth control. She said, we do not want the world to go out that we want to exterminate. We don't want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. This is her word. I'm giving you her, the mother of Planned Parenthood. And do you know that Planned Parenthood sites are disproportionately located inside or right next to black communities? Did you know that? Nationally. Now, there's more white people than black people. We only, what, 17% of the entire population. So how is it that most of the uh, Planned Parenthood sites are within or right next to where we sleep at? Because it was put there for you. But you thought that when they passed the 13th Amendment that everything was fine. Or some of you thought that when the Civil Rights Bill came in 65, you was fine. And some of you thought that the Voting Rights Act in 68 was fine. And then some of y'all think that when Obama came in, he was fine. Never mind the fact that he's against an apology for slavery or he's against affirmative action or he's against reparations. Never mind the fact he's against everything Martin Luther King died for. But y'all got his face right next to King's on your shirt. King is turning around in his grave. The marriage bed is the most degenerating influence in the social order, according to Margaret Singer. Next slide. If your parents are stupid enough to deny you access to birth control and you are under 18, you can get it on your own called Planned Parenthood. Most states have stripped away the rights that parents have over their children's lives. It's a national movement. Children can make reproductive decisions at 16 in most states. So if, a, if your 16-year-old daughter wants to get an abortion and she don't want you to know, she can do it at 16. In most states, a child can get mental health care at 14. If your child wants therapy, if they want to check themselves into a drug and alcohol rehab, they can do it at 14. Okay? This has been going on systematically. It's reducing the true age of adulthood without saying it. And if you want to fool a black person, all you got to do is put it in the words because we don't analyze anything. All we do is take what somebody tells us on TV, magazine, and you run. Okay? Planned Parenthood advertisement, Dallas Observer, January 30th, 1986. This was in there. 1986, that's your lifetime. If your parents are stupid enough to deny you access to birth control and you are under 18, you can get it on your own. Next slide. Margaret Sanger helped develop the abortion pill. Did you know that? The IUD, intrauterine device, and supported a law requiring forced sterilization of women who sought public assistance. Did you know that? Which was law in 38 of the United States. It was never adopted federally. But just because they don't say it in D.C. doesn't mean any of the 50 states can do it on their own. It's what we call states' rights. Did you know that? Up until the 80s, a significant portion of states in this union, if you got public assistance, you were also sterilized. We thought they were only doing it in Africa and in the Caribbean. It was right here. I'll give you one better. I'll give you one better. Also up until the 1970s in some states in America, if your IQ score, if your intelligence quotient fell within the deficient range, you were also automatically sterilized. Did you know that? A lot of our ancestors were sterilized just because the IQ score, which is a racist test, I know because I give it for a living, okay? I help standardize some of them. The I, people always ask me, well, why is it that the black kids' IQ scores are 15 points lower than the white kids? And why can't we close the black-white test gap? Don't y'all hear this all the time? So let me tell you why. It's real simple. Who makes the test? And whenever they create a test, you know what they do? We still test all the questions. So let's say I'm going to put 100 questions in my I'm going to field test 1,500. I'm going to do some testing on whites, black, Hispanic, Asian, mentally retarded, learning disabled, emotionally disturbed, Pennsylvania, L.A., Texas. You get a big sample. I participate in this so I know how they do it. And so you see what questions the black kids get wrong. And you see what questions the white kids get right. So when you come up with your final test, you know what you do? All you do is take the ones that the white kids did better on. Remember. White racism is never left up, never left up to chance. School and education must mirror the social order. The dominant belief in this country is white over black, period. You understand? So when the tests come out, no matter how hard these young brothers and sisters study, there's always going to be a 15-point gap. And do you know what they do to make sure there's always going to be a 15-point gap? Every 10 years they do what? Re-standardize the test. And you running around trying to get Raheem to study and Raheem why you can't catch up. It's designed 
The question that I have for black educators and black parents, why don't you have your own standards for education? Why are we using a European version? A European version that is the lowest of all the industrialized European nations on the earth. You following him and he dead last. So where are you going to come in at? Every community must ask itself, what is the purpose of education first and foremost? What is it for? What should the finished product look like? That's what you've got to ask yourself. The first of all educations that our ancestors taught us in non-violent civilizations was the knowledge itself. But you got black PhDs, black doctors, black lawyers who can't tell these black kids five minutes of African history. And if you don't know where you come from, nothing else much matters. What good is it to master science and math and politics when you've lost yourself? And that's where we are right now. A true African-centered education got to first teach these children to do what? who they are, and how to navigate this society. I had a black educator ask me the other day, she said, well, Mr. Johnson, if we teach these black boys what we've been through, they're going to hate white people. I said, let's look at the alternative. First of all, if you teach them right, they won't hate anybody, because hatred is wasted energy. Do you understand? To hate is a waste of energy. I don't hate, I seek to understand them. If you don't teach them what they've been through and you tell them all they got to do is get a good education, get a good job, you know what? They're going to walk out there in the real world and they're going to see you lie and then they're going to come back and they're going to hate you, not the white man. Because you sent them out there ill-prepared to deal with that madness. Even at my internship, I'm telling these young black boys, you need to understand something. In here, you get away with murder because you have a so-called diagnosis. You ADHD, you conduct disorder, you ED. So when you mess up, you don't get in trouble. I said, listen to me, young man. When you get outside and you start mouthing off at one of them cops, and he tell you to stay still and you jumping around anyway, and you tell him that you got ODD and you can't control it, he don't have to respect that. When you run into the law, no mental disorder is above the law. Do you understand? So when we teach these boys that you can't control yourself unless you have a pill, we are crippling them for life, and we don't even see it. To my single-parent mothers, you got to stop crippling your sons. There's an old saying in our community that we raise our daughters and we love our sons. That's so true. The daughters, you make them strong and independent because you know what you went through. But then your son, you let him sleep all day, don't go to school. He eating over there. He ain't even got to go to school, just football practice, no discipline in the house. And we wonder what's going on. And brothers, we got to step up. Even if you got a son of your own, there should be, every brother in here should be accountable to one other black boy that ain't his child. It takes a village to raise, and we are being so selfish. When I give educational presentations, you know what bothers me? When somebody comes in and says, you know what, I don't have no kids, I don't need them. What do you mean you don't have no kids? In the African tradition, every child belongs to the race. There is no such thing as mine and yours. Do you want to know why? Because if my seven-year-old daughter grows up and she's 18, and you didn't properly raise your son, and he grows up and he's 18, he might rape, molest, or hurt my daughter. Now whose business is it? There's no clear separation amongst families. We're one group of people. And I don't know what we think we're hiding because everything we're doing, we didn't did for the last 20 generations, which is bow down to other people. Next slide. The active ingredient. Now we're talking about chemical dependence. You know what's interesting about cocaine? Do you know that cocaine was brought to America by European scientists to give to enslaved Africans so that they could work longer on the plantation? Did you know that? Cocaine was brought here for you, and they want to lock everybody up for it when they brought it here. Marijuana was brought here for you. And the first law against marijuana came into creation because it was believed that when black men was intoxicated with drugs, they would go around and violate white women. Look at that. Crack and weed. The history starts with you. But the active ingredient in cocaine was isolated, brought to America during the eve of the Civil War given to slaves to help increase their productivity. Cocaine was brought to America for black folks. Next slide. Also, you need to know that every drug in America was once legal at one point. Did you know that? Heroin, opium, crack, every drug in America was once legal. They pick and choose what is illegal based on what? Social engineering. Which ones did the blacks use? Which ones did the white use? Look at Bill Clinton. Mandatory minimum five years in jail for five grams of crack. But if you smoke powder, you need 500 grams to get a mandatory minimum sentence of five years. 
Now, as a psychologist, I know that crack and powder exert the same damage and influence on the human psyche. Both of them have equal addictive power. Do you understand? So why is it that if you sell five grams of crack, you get five, but you need 500 grams of powder to get five? It's called picking and choosing who you want to lock up. It's that simple. Although only 12 to 20% of the U.S. population, blacks account for more than half of all whiskey and malt liquor sales. Cadillacs, too. <laughs> and then they talk about reparations, and they say, well, we need... Re yes, we're entitled to reparations, but Umar Abdullah Johnson does not think we should be fighting for it right now. Do you want to know why? Because the black community is totally disorganized, and your leadership is very weak and self-serving. If the United States government called black leaders to the White House and said, we got a $5 billion check, half them Negroes going to run off with half of it and give you the pennies. And because you don't own your own stores, banks, hospitals, in 48 hours, that money be right back where it came from. Do you understand? Because the black dollar does not circulate one time in its own community. The first time you pull your dollar out, you give it to somebody else. The Jewish dollar goes through 20 times. The European dollar goes through 13 times. Even the Oriental dollar, and it ain't even but so many of them in these United States, at least goes through five times. Why does our dollar only go through once? And you want reparations? It's going to end up right back in their hands. You're going to run out, get a car with some rims on it, get some blonde hair, go date some white woman. You know what you're going to do. I know what you're going to do. Because your whole mind has been engineered from the outside. You think you're special. Next slide. Unfortunately, black media outlets are willing to sacrifice good journalism for profit as many black media outlets run dozens of advertisements for what? Cigarette and liquor companies using hip-hop to entice young black teens to use their drugs. And the government even allows the cigarette companies to sell their drugs using cartoons. Now, who do you think they target in the cartoon for? Do y'all follow me? Anything you see on TV desensitizes you to the effects of it. That's how you control the people. It's called propaganda. And if you've never read a book on propaganda, go and get one. It is the deliberate controlling of people's minds through the images that you saw. CNN, C-SPAN, controlled by big corporate business during the presidential race. Obama, I told people Obama would win soon when he got in the race. They said, well, why do you say that? He's black. If you say so, but that ain't why you're going to win. He's going to win because he was chosen back when he was at Columbia University as an undergrad. Do you know who Obama's undergrad advisor was? A man by the name of Zbigniew New Brzezinski. Do you know who Zbigniew New Brzezinski was? He's the man that the Rockefeller family paid in 1973 to create the Trilateral Commission and the Council on Foreign Relations. You got to study this stuff, black people. Study it. You ain't going to get nothing new from him. It's the same old thing. You'll see in eight years because y'all not convinced yet. Next slide. Tobacco and liquor are drugs. Cigarettes and alcohol kill more blacks every year than cocaine and marijuana. Let me say that again. More of us will die from cigarettes and alcohol than we will from weed or crack. So why does weed and crack send you to jail, but alcohol and cigarettes don't? You notice that? Because alcohol, first of all, one thing you got to understand about the government again, and when I say government, I'm speaking of all European governments, that's France, Britain, UK. Do you know that illegal drugs and legal drugs are made by the same people? Did you know that? Do you know that illegal drugs is worth $500 billion a year to the United States economy? Without illegal drugs, Wall Street would crash. Why did America go into Afghanistan in 911? Was it to make the world first safe for democracy? It ain't safe here. Because Afghanistan is the number one poppy producing country on the face of the earth. If you don't believe me, go and look it up. The Taliban have burned all the poppy seed in Afghanistan. And former Secretary of State Colin Powell went over there and gave them a $50 million grant, which was reported in the New York Times. Why would the Secretary of State for the United States be given the Afghani people, $50 million to replant poppy seed so America gets its supply. And Wall Street will fall without it. You don't need a computer every day. You don't need a car every day. You don't need a toaster every day. You don't need a video game every day. But crack, you need. So they funnel the drug profit to Wall Street so Wall Street can stay afloat, good people. 
the number one business of America is drugs. What made America big? Tobacco and hemp. Hemp is nothing but marijuana. Do you know more hemp was grown in America than any other crop during the revolutionary period? And they're talking about the anti-drug. If they was anti-drug, there would have never been no American Revolution. Next slide. In the early 1900s, white employers used to give cocaine to black workers to increase energy and stamina. Next slide. The Harrison Narcotics Act of 1914, the same year that the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey started the largest organization in black history, the Universal Negro Improvement Association of African Communities League. Jamaica, he came to America in 1916. UNIA was incorporated in 1916. Okay, he gave us the what? The Negro World, the most powerful, prolific, and well-known black newspaper of all time. Nothing today can touch it. He gave us the Black Star Line Steamship Corporation, the only major leader to put ships on the water for black people. He gave us the Negro Factories Corporation. He gave us two colleges. He gave us black men who stood up and defended the black community away from the Ku Klux Klan. And do you know who helped to bring down the Honorable Market? And most of all, he gave us the what? Red, black, and green flag, Madison Square Garden, 1920. That flag we did not have before Garvey. And the significance of the flag is this. Prior to the first international convention for Negro peoples, okay, black people had no symbol to represent them universally as a race. In fact, there was a very popular song that said, every race has a flag except the coon. Coon is another word for the N-word. And Marcus Garvey said, we're going to do something about that. But jealous black leaders like W.E.B. Du Bois, who I respect for the good that he did, A. Philip Randolph, who I respect for the good that he did, and others conspired with the United States government to get the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey locked up on mail fraud charges claiming that he falsely advertised stock for his Black Star Line Steamship Corporation in an empty envelope that was believed to have had something in it to incriminate Garvey that they could never find, which was owned by a black men who claimed he used to work for Marcus Garvey, that Marcus Garvey never saw a day in his life. And the presiding judge at the Garvey trial was an NAACP member and friend of W.E.B. Du Bois. Garvey gets deported in 1927 and 1930, the Nation of Islam. 1930, you get the rebirth of the more science symbols. You get Father Divine, you get Daddy Grace. From Garvey, we get Malcolm X. Malcolm's father was killed because he was chapter president of the UNIA. Malcolm's mother used to write poetry for the Negro world. The black Hebrews, J. Arnold Ford, who's one of the fathers of the black Hebrews, wrote the universal African anthem for the Garvey movement. There is no black leader you get, I care not who you name, who did not take a page out of Garveyism. And that's not a slight, because everybody comes from something. Garvey wasn't the first person who said, your God better look like you. That was Bishop Henry McNeil Turner. He wasn't the first one who took a ship to Africa. Paul Cuffey did that. Martin Delaney did that. The Liberian Exodus Joint Stop Steamship Corporation. I'm telling you to study your history. You got to be able to sit in a chair, sit your children down, sit your grandchildren down, and give them the history out of your mouth. We call it the oral tradition. And the reason we can't follow it no more because we stopped studying who we are. And so one of the things I try to prepare black kids for where I go is to know their history because when they get to college, them white kids know who they are. Them oriental kids know who they are, and they're going to start talking about history, and we're going to start talking about sneakers. Hip-hop culture. How could it be a black culture when the whole thing is controlled by white people? There's not a rapper you can name who own their own publishing. Not one. To my young black men in here, Rockefeller's not no label. Rockefeller's owned by Def Jam, and Def Jam is owned by Universal. Don't know black people sit on the board at Universal. G-Unit is owned by Eminem, who's a racist, and he's owned by Aftermath, and Aftermath is owned by Interscope. That's a Jewish corporation. Don't know black people own Interscope. What's wrong with us? And we got our kids running around thinking these Negroes out here got some power. Black culture. Yeah, right. Next slide. Blacks, drugs in the United States government. Marijuana was banned for the same reason cocaine was, as it was believed to cause a violent effect on degenerate races i.e. black men would attack white women, which was not true. Next slide. CIA, Cocaine Import Agency. Did you know, did you know that the CIA was started by a Wall Street banker 
Why would a Wall Street banker be interested in starting the Central Intelligence Agency? Because everybody knows that the job of the CIA is to oversee drug trafficking. Yes, you can sell drugs in America if you have permission from the government. Do you know why they was going to invade Colombia? Who can tell me why they was going to invade Colombia? Because they didn't want to funnel their money through Wall Street. The Colombian drug lord said, uh-uh, we can handle this ourselves. And they said, well, you, this is against the government. The world is nothing but gangsters and thugs. You fail to understand this. Why do you think the atomic weapons are so big? Because America got one. The UK got one. So what's that, uh, North Korea? Well, y'all want to keep picking on me? I'm going to get one. Now what? Now everybody got their hammer out. Because the only way to protect yourself in these days and ages is through power, organized strength. But the only time you can get black people together is for the Super Bowl or the playoffs. Or Obama inauguration. Next slide. Why was the CIA founded by a Wall Street banker to oversee the laundering and the drug profit? Next slide. Harrison Narcotics Act, the year Garvey started the UNIA. Look at this. Did you know that Ritalin is a type B drug? This is the Drug Enforcement Agency of America. This ain't Umar Johnson. Why would the United States Drug Enforcement Agency put Ritalin, the number one selling anti-stimulant in the world, why is it classified as Schedule B? You know what that means? That means it's just as addictive as crack. According to the government, Ritalin is just as addictive as crack. Look at this. Crack, ecstasy, cocaine, opium. Class B, amphetamines, barbiturates, those are speeders. Class C's is steroids. Ritalin goes up here, class A, excuse me. It's a class A drug. Next slide. Kids even sell it. In the schools where I work, they sell, they psychotropics so they can get high because that's one of the side effects. And we know Xanax. Xanax is crazy in the hood. Everybody's selling their Xanax, okay? Black people don't want to deal with the reality as we see it and fix it. We just want to escape, so we just want to beam on up. In his book, Dark Alliance, West Coast reporter Gary Webb proved that the CIA and the FBI conspired to pour cheap drugs in the black community to destabilize the community and finance covert operations in South America. Get the book. White reporter Gary Webb. If I'm not mistaken, they might have killed him. Did they kill Gary Webb? Okay, they killed him once he came out with this book. Okay? So why do you think the Black Panther Party of yesterday was so thoroughly destroyed by the government? Because they tried to stop drugs. That is a government industry, but they didn't know it at the time. But by the time they was done, they realized it. To fight drugs in the black community is to fight the government itself because they supply it. You saw the movie The Godfather. What did Corleone say? Give the drugs to the black because they have no hope. Next slide. Vice President Dick Cheney and Ali North worked together on several international drug trafficking projects. One thing you need to understand about the presidency, because most of y'all think the presidency is a person, right? Because that's what you get in civics class. The presidency is an institution with a face on it. There are hundreds of men and women who tell them people what to say out their mouth. Will you please get that through your head? Why did Obama say this? Obama ain't doing nothing but reading from a script. Why is he president? Because white supremacy is on one leg. The last eight years, they didn't mess up the world so much that the world is about to say, we ain't scared of you no more, and you're not going to bully us around. So the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, the Federal Reserve, the Bilderbergers, the Rothschilds, and all the Europeans who run this country got together and said, if we want to save it, we got to put a new face on it. So somebody said, how about him? He's half and half. They said he can talk well. Put him in there. Obama's job is to put America back to where it used to be. He's their last chance. He ain't there to undo white supremacy. He's there to re-strengthen it. He just came back from Ghana. What you think he was over there, giving a shout out to Kwame Nkrumah? Hell no! He's over there trying to make Ghana safe for what? Financial exploitation through American gas and oil companies because the west coast of Africa has the what? Largest untapped source of oil and gas on the planet Earth. Do you know what that means? That means that you're going to start seeing a whole bunch of terrorists being made up by the news, and they're going to be in Africa. Because you know the job is to do what? Create an enemy that don't exist so you can go in 
and solve the problem that you started and come out with some gas and oil. And we got our young kids worshiping diamonds. I don't want no young people worshiping no diamonds and no gold because you all need to know that there's enough diamonds under the soil of Africa that if you put every diamond on the world market at the same time, you drop the price of diamonds to a nickel apiece. And they sell them for $20,000. You want to know why? Because the Oppenheimer family that controls the diamond industry, which comes from Cecil John Rose, who conquered South Africa and killed nearly 50 million blacks, cut off breath and everything else to intimidate the South African so that nobody would sell a diamond but him, created a scholarship program called the Rhodes Scholar. And the purpose of the Rhodes Scholarship Program was to do what? Train leaders who will continue to imbibe, as he said, quote, the British imperial ethos. The British imperial ethos. The Rose Scholarship Program is a program for white supremacy. They just started giving blacks Rose Scholarships in the 70s. But the black ones do the same thing. Help white supremacy stand strong. Y'all got to know this. Y'all got to know this. The Eipenheimer hires mercenaries to go through Africa. And if they find anybody selling diamonds, they kill them. I'm telling you what I know. They kill them. You better not be found with a diamond in Africa or your brains will be taken from you. Why do you think there's no diamond countries over there? In the Congo, they run through the water, brothers and sisters. They run through the water. Like rocks. And you over here killing yourself for it? Do you know how the diamond became the engagement ring of choice? The Oppenheimer family put millions of dollars into a television public relations campaign where hundreds of white women was flashed on TV for 10 years with a diamond. And they equated diamond with love so they could get rich. So the question to the sisters is, are you loyal enough to Africa to not want one? Next slide. We'll deal with that later. <laughs> Chemical dependence. Diaster, Setco, Vortex, Refugals, European firms. All four of these firms smuggled drugs and were on the CIA's list of approved vendors receiving subsidies from the U.S. government. Why would drug smuggling corporations be getting subsidized by the U.S. government? Because the number one business on Wall Street is drugs. Actually, it's the number two. What was the number one business on Wall Street? You! Slavery! You was the first thing traded. You were the first stock and bond. Do you know that most of the insurance companies in America were started by doing what? Insuring the slave ships? Because you know only half the cargo made it. In fact, they called the African in America the strongest African on the face of the earth because you had to come from the continent, go to the Caribbean, get broke through really lynched psychologically, right? And then they brought you here. So they say, if you can make it through all that psychological and biological madness, you got to be the strongest ones around. Physically, we are. Mentally, we're weak. Why do you think slavery ended in the Caribbean in 1831? You know why it ended 30, 40 years sooner than 1865? Because in the Caribbean, they were not as thoroughly broken as us. Ours lasted a little bit longer, not because we didn't have as much courage, but because it was harder to organize blacks in North America than it was in the Caribbean. Because some of us still believe in the preamble to the Constitution. Written by Thomas Jefferson, who owned over 400 slaves. He got a million and one kids running around with his last name. And the white side, I don't know if you heard about this, the white side don't accept the black side, and they won't allow any of the black descendants of Thomas Jefferson to partake in his vast estate. They say, we don't recognize them. They were slave babies. Yeah, they might be his, but they ain't ours. But every biracial black person is running around like they got two families because they don't understand white supremacy. They don't understand it. You're pure blood, Anglo. That's it. Any mixture, take it home. Next slide. The FBI and the CIA have undercover police officers in every major city in the United States to supervise the inner city drug trade. Did you know that? There are people in the Muskegon, Michigan Police Department who are undercover officers. The district don't even know to make sure that no, none of you revolutionaries go around trying to mess with the weed and the crack sales because you're messing with Wall Street. Next slide. 
A recent Philadelphia Daily News article ran a story on a police officer who had a poster in his locker that read blue by day, white by night. You have the Ku Klux Klan and you got the Blue Klux Klan. B-L-U-E. Blue Klux Klan. Next slide. The United States government relies on its policies to intimidate and interrogate innocent blacks as a means of enforcing fear of the state. This role was once occupied by the slave driver. Now the police own it. And anybody who knows the history of the police know that who became the police? The police became the, the slave driver class, the uh, overseer class, also the Italian and the Irish immigrants who couldn't stand blacks because they said we were taking their jobs, went right into the police force. The same people who were lynching you for 100 years can now beat you legally with a badge. Next slide. But don't believe me. I want you to research this now. Rodney King syndrome. Can't we just all? Since the 1990 police beating of Rodney King, followed by riots, worst acts of police oppression have occurred with very little outcry from the black community. It appears that the black community has now become numb to police misconduct. We don't do anything about it. Another one beat up by the cops. Next slide. Police brutality. 2006-2007, the Philadelphia police shot. 82 civilians, most of them black, killing 37. Yet, since 2005, only 11 police have been shot by civilians, with two being killed. So why do we keep hearing that police are being victimized? It ain't okay to shoot police, but it definitely ain't okay to shoot young black boys. But if only two, and we're looking at Philly, if only two were killed, but yet y'all killed 37 of us, how is it that the media is making it like the police are the ones being shot and killed? It's called propaganda. Propaganda is what? The science of controlling the way people think. I can make you like Obama, but if I ask one of you, why did you vote for him, you probably give me a silly reason. When I ask people why they voted for Obama, you know this. One person said he was handsome. Somebody else said, I like his swag. Okay? Somebody else said he was black. Negro reasons. See, those are Negro reasons. Give me a concrete reason why you voted. You don't even know. Because the news in the Urban League... And the NAACP, both are white organizations, by the way, they control the way you think. And the next thing you know, you're at the ballot box voting, and you don't even know why. Propaganda. Next slide. And for those of you voting for him, there's nothing wrong with that. I just want you to study him a little bit more. Okay? It don't matter whether you vote for him or not, as far as I'm concerned. Why? Because you don't pick presidents. People never did. You have never chosen a president in this country, black people or white people. The President of the United States has always been elected by the Electoral College, which is the private group of men who are put in office by the bankers who run this country to choose who they want. The United States of America is not a democracy. And if you disagree with me, I ask you to show me the word in your Constitution. Show me the word in the Declaration of Independence. Show me the word in the Michigan State Constitution. It is not there. They have played with your mind because you do not study. A thinking man can never be made a slave. A thinking woman can never be made a slave. You must question and think everything. Everywhere I go, I carry a little pad and a pen because when I hear something, I say, okay, that sounds like it kind of matched me, but I need to research that. Take nothing for granted. Get that information. Next slide. I think you skipped one. From 1998 to 2006, 2,883 people were murdered in Philadelphia. 85% of them were blacks killed by other blacks. Why do we have so much black on black homicide? Because black people hate each other. It's the same reason why you got just as much black abortion. It's the same reason why we don't own nothing. It's the same reason why every time you start a black organization, it falls within a couple years, unless it's run by some mega maniac, ego maniac, who uses it to get rich. Okay? Why? Because black people have no interest in themselves. We are known to fight like cats and dogs. If we try to start a movement in here right now, somebody's going to jump up and say, unless you're dealing with Jesus, I got to leave. Somebody's going to say, if this ain't Muslim, I got to go. If this ain't Hebrew, I'm out of it. If it ain't no fraternities and sororities in it, what's that got to do with it? We suffer what we suffer because we're African, not for what we believe. Okay? I've never known... Good looking. I've never known. Okay. My color. You know what's so crazy? I was in Malawi, Republic of Malawi, 
Southeast Africa, who has the flag of the red, black, and green, but it's reversed. They don't even know who Garvey is. The man, Dr. Banda, who led Malawi to independence was a comrade, colleague of Patrice Lumumba, Kwame Nkrumah. He studied medicine in Detroit or Chicago. He was a member of the Garvey movement. He goes back to Malawi, gives them the flag, and today Africans don't even know what Garvey is and what. It's amazing. You think we don't know who we are? They don't know either. And you want to know why? Because they can't afford the books. A book that costs you $20, go to Ethiopia, one U.S. dollar is 42 Ethiopian dollars, they got to pay $400 for that same book. Y'all see that? They can't afford it. They can't afford the information over there. Next slide. Homicide. Blacks are no more than 20% of the population. 45% of all murder victims in 2002 were black, 91% killed by other blacks. Do you know that black men have made history as being the only human group on the face of the earth whose number one cause of death was each other? And then we make rap songs about how great a killer we are, and then we let our boys listen to it. And we let our daughters listen to it. And when he start calling the N-word, you want to know why. And when she start allowing herself to be called the B-word, you want to know why. Because you allow their minds to be conditioned through music and who they hang with. And if you're the parent of a teenager and you have never invited your teenager's friends over the house for